Hello and welcome to Economic Solutions. I'm Leonard Zane and I'm joined here today by Gerald Kaminsky, a professor of UCLA, and by Don Kramer, who is a risk management and evaluation specialist. Today's program is a very interesting one in our background of economic solutions. It's called How to Deliver Medicare for All. This is very topical today in terms of what are the economics involved? You hear a lot of things in uh, the political venues about the desirability of this or that, but how would something like this actually be delivered if it could be delivered? And so today's program is rather a feasibility uh, approach on if there were Medicare for all. We have one approach here that we will present on how it could actually be provided and delivered uh, for all American citizens. And so beginning with this, we have, first of all, goals. There are seven goals as we see it for Medicare for all. The first one, America is the wealthiest country in the world, and why shouldn't it have the world's highest standard of national health care for all Americans? We believe this is certainly achievable and should be a goal of Medicare for All. Secondly, to deliver this universal Medicare for All health care with no patient cost sharing. That means no deductibles, no co-payments when you visit for any health care at all. This is is it unique, Jerry? Uh, it, the cost sharing is, is fairly common uh, throughout the world, and most high income nations provide some requirement for cost sharing. Okay. At this point, I would also like to provide a little background about our guest today. Professor Gerald F. Kaminsky is a professor of health policy and management, a senior fellow at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research and also a professor in UCLA's School of Public Affairs. His research focuses on evaluating the costs and financing of public insurance programs, including Medicare, Medicaid, workers' compensation. Since 2010, his research has focused on evaluating the expected and actual impacts of health care reform under the Affordable Care Act, ACA. He has co-led the development of a micro simulation model, CalSim, for forecasting eligibility, enrollment, and expenditures under the ACA in California. Dr. Kaminsky received his PhD in public policy analysis from the University of Pennsylvania Horton School in 1985 and his AB from the University of Chicago in 1978. Now Don Kramer has been a business risk manager and consultant specializing in employee safety and health for over 30 years in the Western United States. He holds a bachelor's degree from Oregon State University and is a risk management associate of the Institute's Risk and Insurance Knowledge Group of Malvern, Pennsylvania. So we're very fortunate today to have experts like this join us. Uh, Jerry, you've been on the program in other aspects yes. before, yes, and uh, we've always been very enlightened by whatever you've contributed. So back to our goals here for Medicare for All. We want to limit benefits no more than Medicare currently does. We want to have a standard uh, level of care throughout the country for everybody in the Medicare for All programs. We want to, number five, deliver this at less cost than the current system. Now we're going to show some things about comparing the cost of health care in the United States with the costs in other uh, advanced countries. We're going to see how the U.S. ranks uh, relative to them. So we want to do better than we're doing now, and we're going to show relatively how much we spend now. We're not going to claim we're going to do highly better than we're doing now. We, because of the fact that we want to deliver this standard with no cost sharing, uh, it's a very high standard of care and therefore it's going to cost more than some other countries do, but not as much as the current system. Then number six, transition to universal Medicare for all health care in five years. We would like to accomplish this transition in five years 
and we have a plan to show how that would work. Finally, number seven, we want to aid private health care financing workers in a four-year transition. What happens to insurance company workers and brokers who would be affected by this? We have a plan to accommodate them. So those are the seven goals. Uh, any comments on the goals, gentlemen? Uh, not at this time. Don? Yeah, this is a good outline, and I appreciate the fact that we've put a timeline in there because this is a transition uh, proposition. You can't just do it at once. You have to allow for a, a scaling or a ramp up, whatever the word may be, and a, a transition period of four to five years would be appropriately like the minimum. It's a project. Mm -hmm. And like any project, uh, you're building a new aircraft. Mm -hmm. and you have to have phases, stages. You have to dovetail everything in, and we have done an awful lot of research in preparation for this program to hopefully provide phasing that could actually be feasible. Uh, here we are, uninsured rate among the non-elderly population. Uh, Jerry, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so it, if we look at the uh, where we've been in the United States over the last three decades, four decades. This chart shows that going back to 1972, seven years after the enactment of Medicare and Medicaid, we still had 16, roughly 17 percent. That's one out of six non-senior uh, uh, members of, of our population without insurance. We saw a slight dip um, in, in the mid-1970s. Uh, Part of this was because of a change in the way that data were reported, and so this may not have been a true reduction as much as an artifact of some differences in the way that the uninsurance rate. But you can see for decades we've hovered around 16 to 17 percent. And of course the major change that took place here uh, uh, in 2010 was the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and the major provisions of that law went into effect uh, in 2014 and you can see what happened. We had the largest reduction in the percentage of uninsured that we've ever experienced in the decades that we've been tracking the rate of uninsurance in the United States. And uh, we've seen dramatic improvement. But the bottom line is that despite all of the success of the ACA in its primary objective, which is reducing the percentage of uninsured, we still have a higher rate than any other developed nation. We're the only nation in the world that tolerates roughly 10% of its population being uninsured. Um, and uh, in terms of equity of our healthcare system, this, this is why, and we'll be talking about this in, in a few more minutes, why the United States is rated so poorly um, in comparisons with other countries, because we have the least equitable healthcare system of any industrial nation. So the least equitable would mean, uh, in, other, in other words, uh, maybe the least fairly treating or evenly treating of people covered. And this percentage now, which is hovering uh, around 10.6 uh, or so percent, uh, it's 30 million people, 29.6 million people who are not elderly, who are not covered by uh, health care insurance. And so we have a big chunk, even with the Affordable Care Act, not covered at all. That's exactly right. Oh, here's an interesting one. Okay, uh, Don, you want to comment on this slide here? Well, certainly the United States has a tremendous uh, GDP. It uh, sustains a lot of things that are expensive, of course, the national debt and other obligations, bonds, and so forth. But as we refer to this specific chart, you'll see that our health care cost is exceedingly high as a percentage of that overall cost compared to the, our European counterparts, which would probably be the composition of the European Union along the Pacific Rim, including Japan and Australia. Uh, this indicates to me that we've got something financially that's not quite matched up to what we need. We have um, a population, as you just mentioned, that, that are not covered under the, under the care, medical care, and yet the costs for those that are, are just escalating this thing even higher than should be. So I think if we solve the, the, the latter, that is, get everybody insured, this should come down because there will be more um, money applied to health care and hopefully a better improved population, a more healthy population, people that are working and productive and not uh, 
suffering the effects of bad health or um, other issues that may contribute to the cost of uh, medical cost itself. Um, but we want to keep in mind as well that the tax rates and other uh, cost uh, centers in these other nations, particularly the, the top three you see there, France, Sweden, and Germany, are particularly high compared to our tax system. And a, a tax equity might be something to consider. I think you probably have a, a thought or two about that later in the program today. Well, I could address that. Uh, that's a good point, Don. Actually, um, Denmark, which has scored very high in academic studies of national happiness. Uh, when the studies were first done in 2006, they were rated number one happiest country in the world. They pay 52% of their income on average in taxes. Mm -hmm. But what do they get for those taxes? They get universal health care. They get universal access to higher education. In other words, uh, free uh, public college uh, education. And they have very low poverty because they spend this money on all kinds of relief. So they decided to do that. And uh, the first national happiness study, which was done by University of Leicester in England mm -hmm. in 2006, found out, well, Denmark is number one in happiness. Mm -hmm. Switzerland was also up there very high with them. So it depends on where do you want to spend your money uh, for the most well-being? And we're just beginning to measure well-being in the world now. This is a new concept. It wasn't done before. It's true. And, and there, there's been other work, uh, including the study that was just published the other day, that talks about the total spending on social services in countries, not just health care services. And although we, we're not going to be talking about it in terms of a graph in today's program, there's data to support that the United States, although we spend far more than any other nation in terms of, it, of GDP or per capita on health care services, medical services, that our spending on social programs is much smaller per capita and as a percentage of GDP than almost every other nation on this. So when you combine the two, we're de decidedly sort of in the middle of the pack hmm. and it uh, uh, it's led a lot of researchers to conclude that our poor health outcomes are partially related to the fact that we spend so much on medical care after people get sick rather than on broader social services to keep people healthy and happy and productive. Oh, that's enlightening. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to look at now just what the ranking is in terms of what we spend on the average per capita for health care. Now, Jerry, you say this is actually higher now. Our uh, United States, uh, under this chart, um, our health care system cost averaged about $9,451 per person, but that was back in 2014. Right. And what is it now? So uh, it, the 2017 data for the U.S. shows that we're spending per capita close to $11,000 per person in the United States. And uh, the, the, these relative rankings are going to be essentially the same today as they were in 2014 when this when this uh, uh, when these data were compiled but uh, the point is that we're no matter how you measure whether it's a percentage of our overall economy or whether it's on a per capita basis we're spending far more than any other industrial or high income nation so here the average OECD is about thirty eight hundred dollars per person and if now we're over eleven thousand, we should be three times healthier <laughs> for that kind of expenditure and okay. that kind of spending. <laughs> uh, let's. Oh, now this is a very interesting chart. I, I know that you have a lot of ideas about this one, uh, Jerry, and I think you initiated this chart or you started referencing this chart some time ago. So again, this is uh, data, comparative data that's been collected by the Commonwealth Fund. They've been one of the the organizations in the U.S. that's really looked at these international comparisons for almost 30 years now and documented how we perform relative to other high-income nations. And I particularly like this graph because it captures what is, the concept is healthcare and more specifically mortality amenable to healthcare intervention. So um, there are deaths that no matter how good your healthcare is are going to occur anyway. But increasingly, researchers are able to identify basically preventable deaths and deaths where effective early intervention 
by the healthcare system will help prevent those deaths. And what's so interesting to me about the data here is that um, you can see that every country between 2004 and 2014 improved and improved somewhat dramatically. And uh, that's good news for everybody. It means that our healthcare systems are more effective. Um, we're keeping people alive. Uh, and this is great news for, for people across the globe. What's discouraging, of course, is that the United States has uh, improved the least <laughs> amount of any of these nations. On the far right there. And we're far now higher in terms of preventable uh, mortality or mortality amenable to intervention by the healthcare system than any other industrial nation. And this is, we can do better. I'm interested in the UK here. At, in 2004, look at the chart, they were the worst of all the group. They had the highest mortality uh, associated with healthcare in 2004. And bang, they did something in 10 years to come way down there now to where they're quite, they're, they're moderate now. They're still higher than others, but they're moderate. Uh, the United States didn't do too well. We're still the worst in, in that uh, ranking. What happened with the UK? What did they do? So one major change that took place in the UK over the last 15 years is that they've made a conscious decision through the National Health Service to invest in primary care and to incentivize primary care doctors to do a better job of prevention. And uh, although that may not be entirely the reason that accounts for this dramatic improvement, it's certainly the kind of thing that's going to reduce this kind of preventable mortality. If you treat your diabetic patients more effectively, monitor their health, you're going to prevent early and, and, and unnecessary mortality related to what is a very treatable condition. Um, so I think those deliberate, that deliberate policy on behalf of the NHS is probably um, largely responsible for this dramatic improvement during this time period. So I get a bonus if I'm a doctor, if I help my patients do better with their health. Yes. Now, Don, from an insurance standpoint, you've done a lot of risk analyses. Uh, how does this relate, or what are some of your observations from the perspective of the insurance industry? Well, the insurance industry uh, it really likes a healthy population of people to insure. When, when I speak of insurance, I'm talking about coverage that would apply to employers, so it would be uh, workers' compensation, and to some, to some involvement in my, in my career, uh, the health insurance part. So when you look at that, you look at um, a number of things that, that the laws have recently changed you can't really you know, consider, such as uh, uh, pre-existing conditions, age, uh, number of people who smoke, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, but the, but the, the, the interest is to not have um, overall a, a, a catastrophic uh, high loss ratio. When you look at loss ratios in workers' comp, there's certain aspects of it that are okay. They accept it, even though we'd like to think, oh, it's terrible to have somebody get hurt. But from an insurance company perspective, uh, it, it, it is all within their margin of, of expectancy and risk tolerance. Same thing is true with health insurance. It's also experience rated. So if you, if you look at the catastrophic loss, um, which would be, let's say, someone with um, a very serious physical injury, a, 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 an accident where they lose a, a limb, or, or they have a, a very serious disease where it requires a, a lot of, of time and uh, an application of long uh, care uh, procedures. This is, um, this is something that is negative to the insurance company. So what you look at in terms of, of all of this is, is a, is a pre-loss mentality and that's where I came from my perspective of in experience in terms of uh, preventing injuries, um, uh, hazard recognition, uh, certain compliance to certain you know codified remedies, we, we would call those Cal OSHA codes or OSHA codes in the workplace, but also um, and the trend line is going now more toward wellness programs, a, a whole person wellness concept where you're not only looking at, you know, the nine to five, well, be safe here, but we don't care what you do when you get home. No, it's, it's things like 
are you are you living safely are you are you not smoking are you are you driving safely so you don't get in that terrible auto accident and, and cause you uh, disruptive injuries that could impede your ability to even work a, a regular full productive day so we look at, at things like uh, wellness in terms of eating, um, cert certain dietary thing, obesity, uh, uh, weight control, uh, a variety of things which, which would be, we would call the basket of the, the whole wealth uh, uh, programming or concept, not just injury prevention or here in California, the injury and illness prevention program under Cal OSHA uh, Title VIII. So it, it, it really is a cost-driven mentality. It, 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 mind you, insurance companies are, are financial mechanisms, but be that as it may, there is a, there is a quality or, or a quality of life or a quality of, of, of work uh, ethic that goes with that. Mm -hmm. uh, you just don't collect premium and expect your policyholders to behave like you'd like to. You, you, what I did, I went in and consulted the companies to show them ways to improve uh, their, their health of the employees, their, their uh, their culture, their safety culture, and with that comes um, a variety of improvements that can be seen statistically in lower loss frequency, happier employees, people that are apt to follow their doctor's orders when they are injured or they get sick. That's another important thing. A lot of people that are sick and are deriving care from the medical system, it's very difficult for them to follow the order or the prescription of the doctor. Right. Another part of that is, is the care and self-wellness that goes on with this in terms of a broad a broad picture of this. Okay, so given that, that there is an effort that I'm understanding here that the insurance industry is making, still we have a problem. Uh, when we look at this slide, uh, overall health care ranking, again, uh, Jerry, would you like to comment on that? Well, you know, uh, again, the Commonwealth Fund has been doing these comparative studies and what they do is, uh, this chart represents a ranking based on uh, actually a score across about seven different dimensions of the healthcare system. And um, the United, United States ends up uh, at, at the bottom of the list because we're, we're doing poorly in most of these dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the area where we're uh, the strongest uh, relative to, to other countries is in quality of care. Uh, and. Uh, that's not surprising to me. Uh, as an academic researcher, I have colleagues who have spent their entire careers working on ways to improve quality of care, not just in the United States, but worldwide, to develop measures of quality, to uh, provide in the information to, to doctors and to healthcare professionals to do a better job of delivering care. And so uh, we've seen quality improvements dramatically dramatic quality improvements in, in the U.S. and across across the world. But it's the other aspects of our system where we we are not as as, as good as uh, uh, other countries, and so our overall ranking continues to be at the bottom among this select group of, of high-income nations. So with seven criteria that apparently uh, this is referring to, uh, we're at the bottom there, but there are certain exceptions where the United States does very well. Uh, that's, for example, that's correct. For example, what? Well, uh, we tend w for technical services, mm -hmm. um, the things, the surgical interventions. Um, we have some of the best quality of, and the best standard of care mm -hmm. anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, and it's reflected in the fact that you know wealthy individuals from across the world fly to the United States to have their surgery done you know, at various medical centers uh, around around this country, uh, some of the best medical centers that you can name. Uh, but meanwhile, we have millions of Americans who struggle to get to, to have regular access to a primary care physician, to have regular access to medication to treat diabetes. Mm -hmm. The cost of, of, of insulin has been going through the roof recently. These are all factors that lead to an overall decline in population health. Uh, again, these are preventable uh, measures, but they lead to unnecessary mor mortality and morbidity. Um, and this is why we're at the bottom of this list. I see. So now here we go with Medicare for all services and no cost sharing. This is a very unusual approach here that we think we can afford. Under this proposal that we're presenting here, there are six items. Uh, 
The services that people would get for no cost sharing would be primary medical and preventive care, hospital inpatient and outpatient, ambulatory, lab and diagnostics, prescription drugs and medical devices, mental health treatment, reproductive, maternity, newborn and pediatrics, dental, hearing, vision, emergency, short-term rehab, transportation for low-income and disabled, home and community-based long-term care. Now that's kind of a standard um, level of care that is beyond what we're getting in anything like Medicare at the present time, right? Yes. Yes, this, uh, this uh, uh, package of benefits, this, this benefit package, is certainly more generous than the current Medicare program. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, frankly, it is more generous than uh, because of the no cost sharing provision. Uh, of course, the details of the exact services mm -hmm. in each of these categories hasn't been specified yet. But mm -hmm. in terms of the scope of benefits and the absence of any cost sharing, uh, it means that this is more generous than any other nation in the world. No other nation is providing this generous a public benefit. Well, that's impressive, and we will see how we may be able to afford this. There are some exclusions that we have recognized here, generalized exclusions, uh, such as professional services outside the United States and territories. That's not covered by this Medicare for All proposal non-reconstructive cosmetic surgery, uh, blended bifocal eyeglasses and contact lenses, <laughs> certain non-generic drugs. That's just a kind of a sampling of exclusions. Now, as we look at the comparison, we have the current system, and we saw what the current system costs relative to other countries. We saw that it was over $11,000 per capita right now in, in caring for people with regard to health. and we are projecting in this chart a 10-year period from 2022, let's say it could be implemented in 2022, going on to 2031, and this, the current system is higher than what we propose as Medicare for All, but it's not half or a third on our MFA proposal. This proposal is actually, when you look at the cumulative costs that we uh, anticipate and project, the Medicare for All proposal we're presenting in this program would be 84% approximately of the cost of the present system the way it goes right now. But we can provide all of this care that we're doing and, and no cost sharing and still be at 84%. Any comment about that? So this is, uh, the projections are that uh, there are certainly administrative savings associated with having a Medicare for All system. Uh, and that accounts for a large part here. Some of those savings are offset, as, as any health economist will tell you. Some of the savings are offset by the lack of cost sharing and the generosity of the benefit package. So it means that there will be um, uh, increased utilization of services because we've essentially made care free for all. Mm -hmm. And we know that there will be uh, a, a, um, an increase in demand for health care as a result of that. Um, but frankly, the 10-year projections and where a lot of the savings comes from is in government explicitly controlling payments to providers of care. And this is what every other country does in some manner. Uh, even if there's a private insurance market in a country with national health insurance, the prices that are paid to providers to pharmaceutical companies are regulated by the government, mm -hmm. and that controls the growth over time in expenditures. Medicare has been doing this in the United States for over 30 years, um, and it's been effective, but in the private sector, we, we essentially have no regulation of prices, and so our costs continue to go up faster than everyone else's. So Medicare uh, right now could be projected to cost less, provide all of the uh, method, uh, benefits that we summarize there, and if we compare it to the present system, we're saying that the present system by 2031 will have accumulated uh, to cost about 40, $49 trillion uh, by 2031 total in the 10-year period, whereas uh, 
under our MFA proposal, the cost would be about 41 and a quarter trillion. Uh, so that's important to recognize. The current system is going to cost 49 trillion over 10 years. What we're proposing costs 41. It's going to be less. Let's look at how we're going to pay for this. This, uh, we think, is a first in our economic solutions program. I have not seen any data like these in uh, normal media so far. We've done the research to provide the table you see here. And I want to make a comment, too. Uh, one thing I want to clarify. The MFA proposal we're making on this program is not socialized medicine. Socialized medicine is when the government owns these resources and delivery systems and providing systems, such as in the UK. That is true socialized medicine. But what this is, this is actually civic capitalism where the government is channeling the funds to the private sector. And we're saving money there also from the standpoint of administrative costs. The uh, Medicare system right now costs, what, about 2% overhead administration, something like that? Uh, about 2%, yes. And what does private uh, sector delivery cost right now for well, insurance? It, it, it varies. Uh, the large group market is a little more efficient than the small group and individual market, but uh, administrative expenses are capped at 15% uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, the large group market and 20% uh, for, the, for the small group market. So that's, and that's 10 by times. Law. <laughs> yeah, that's, it, that's, it's yeah. Yeah. Much larger. So it's much larger, and this is one way that we're saving with the Medicare for All, plus the fact that the government, if it's a single-payer system, has huge buying power leverage. I mean, they can negotiate these things way down uh, to the minimum cost, whereas if you fragment it, if you have it, let's say, voluntary, if I want to dis decide whether to go into MFA or not, that's not going to be as efficient cost-wise in the way the government can administer it if it's just a single pair. And it doesn't cover everything. If I want um, certain stem cell, very exotic treatment, mm -hmm. yeah, I may go to private insurance to get that or private uh, sources. Again, a Medicare for All system is a standard of care that the whole country gets. It is not the best conceivable care, but it's the way we've structured it, the best uh, that we think uh, can happen in the world. So the first one, uh, Don, well, I'm, I'm going to summarize a little bit, but Don, you might want to comment when we get into some detail. Um, employer paid premiums. Um, currently, we're, uh, there is a proposal, the House of Representatives Bill number 1384, uh, being introduced by Representative uh, Pramila Jayapal of Washington that says, well, we want to make that employer paid uh, premium 7.5%. And we're saying in this program, no, we want to kick it to 10%. And we're still going to show that that saves money. Um, household premiums, uh, again, HR 1384 advocates 4%. We're saying 5%. So I'm going to summarize these, and then I'll ask you two to comment mm -hmm. as we proceed. The next one, health tax savings under H.R. 1384, we're the same. Uh, that's $4.2 trillion uh, over 10 years. Um, raise upper income tax bracket rates. There, the 1384 proposal raises $1.8 trillion over 10 years, $1.8 trillion more. Ours, 2.8 trillion. Raise upper income estate taxes. The current proposal uh, that would be implemented at 1384 would be uh, a quarter of a trillion dollars in 10 years. Ours is a half a trillion. A net worth tax on the top 0.1% of households. That's 16,700 households. That's how many we're talking about. On the net worth tax on the top 0.1% of households, that's 16,700 households. The HR 1384 proposal is 1.30 trillion over 10 years, and ours is 3.9. Uh, S corporation payroll tax on salaries and profits. A lot of an S corporation, uh, if you are a person who has an S corporation, you can claim 
some of your salary is actually part of the profits, you can actually raise your deductible and, and pay less taxes if you do that. Investigations have shown that some of this escort uh, profit is actually, in fact, salaries. And those salaries can be subject to payroll taxes instead of being masked, if you will, under profits. Uh, then the next one, 5% value added tax, net of low income aid. The 8, 1384 proposal does not address that, but 166 nations today employ a value added tax to support government. And we're saying over 10 years, we can raise $2.45 trillion with a value added tax. Jerry, would you like to explain what that is? What well, the value added tax is often described as a national sales tax, and it, it um, uh, taxes uh, goods and services sort of at every stage of production. Um, and so um, it is, in some ways, a very efficient tax um, and um, is an effective mechanism of, of raising revenue. Uh, one of the criticisms is that it is, a because it is essentially a sales tax, that it can be regressive in nature, um, hitting lower income families uh, uh, harder than, than high income families. But uh, there are measures to, to mitigate those negative consequences and make it less regressive. That's apparently what other countries do, is because a sales tax affects a person with a low income uh, more severely uh, relative to people with higher incomes. And so in the countries where they have value added, which is most nations, I, I think the last tally is there's something like 194 nations in the world. So 166 use value added taxes, wow. And they're very efficient because these taxes are collected at each phase of transfer. So if, if a farmer is growing wheat and sells it to a mill, uh, there's a tax on what is paid um, by the mill uh, for, the, uh, for the grain. Then when the mill sells it to a wholesaler, there's another tax at that level. Wholesaler sells it to a bakery, another tax at that level. The bakery sells it to a consumer, another tax. And so these value-added taxes are very easily monitored and collectible, whereas an income tax, a general income tax, is not that efficient. There's a lot of ways of uh, slipping under the radar with uh, income taxes and uh, value added is a is called um, a money machine of uh, certain political uh, sectors uh, liberal sectors of a, of a um, of a society will say well we have to look out for the regressive nature of value added tax so therefore we have to have some kind of assistance to low income people which these countries are doing and then we have people that are uh, on the more conservative side that say, well, my gosh, this thing's a money machine. <laughs> it's, uh, it's creating an enormous amount of money. And that kind of makes us nervous, too, because yes. it is a money machine. <laughs> <laughs> What's it going to be spent It's on? too good. <laughs> Besides Medicare. <laughs> right. Um, then finally, offshore, uh, not finally, but the next one, offshore profits tax. Uh, the 1384 bill is advocating do this one time. We're saying no, do it all the time. Every and so we can raise an enormous amount of money, 8.79 trillion, by having an offshore profit tax uh, as implementing this. And this also encourages companies to be more onshore. So you don't have to pay that tax. It it keeps it brings um, a lot of production back toward uh, domestically toward the country. Uh, then a financial institution fee, um, charging uh, brokerage companies, banks, a um, actually in this case brokerage companies or any sale of stocks and bonds would be subject to a 0.4% security sales tax. So whenever that gets, whenever a stock is sold or bought, 0.4%. Now, the Security Exchange Commission is funded about $2 billion a year with something like a 0.00013% tax. And that raises $2 million just to fund the SEC, $2 billion just to fund the SEC. So this is an amazingly efficient way of, uh, 
of getting revenue. And we're going to talk about some caveats about that too, because other countries have tried this. But we're being much more cautious than other countries were. Uh, finally, eliminate LIFO inventory accounting. LIFO means last in, first out. So if you are in production and you're selling a product, if, you, uh, if you're living in an economy where prices tend to rise over time, then your inventory today, if you costed it as life, last in, first out, would be higher cost than the first inventory you had years mm -hmm. ago. And the current accounting system allows you to cost your inventories at the current cost, which is typically higher than it was back then, which gives you a higher uh, write-off against your taxes. Right. But it, it's, it's a completely fictional way of evaluating inventory. Mm -hmm. You had a comment on that? No. Okay. I, it, uh, no. Okay. But I'm just agreeing with you. Yeah, okay. Uh, so part. eliminating that will raise, actually, and we're doing the same as House uh, Bill 1384, uh, 0.11 trillion over 10 years. So uh, we can raise the 41.27 trillion with this approach. And why is HR 34 only 16.19 trillion? So uh, the, the current bills uh, before Congress are really focused on how to finance the private, the current private contributions, private insurance. What can we do? How, what taxes do we need to raise to replace the private insurance market? And that's what that 16 billion figure represents. What you've presented in this slide is, in addition to that estimate, what could we do to finance all health care by starting over? Basically saying, let's start from scratch and figure out how we're going to cover the nation's entire health bill under a Medicare for all system that's all inclusive. Uh, and what you've shown is that these taxes, you know, set at different, slightly higher rates or, or done more frequently, can replace total current spending, all sources of current spending, including Medicare and Medicaid. And still do it for less than yeah, the current system. Because in the employment world, it wouldn't be necessarily called a tax, but we would call it a benefit, mm -hmm. okay? When I was working full time for a couple of large companies that generated, um, I think they came out every quarter, you know, your benefits, your benefit statement. It wasn't just a pay, a pay stub, which we would get upon demand, just what did I make this week or what would I earn this month? But this was the total cost of employee benefits. That included your contributory costs to health care, to uh, co company vehicle if you had one, um, 401k, company match. So when you totaled all this up, I was amazed, Zane, to see that health insurance for the family in my employment was roughly 20% of my, my gross payroll. I'm going 20% for group wow. medical insurance. That and you're not good. at the bottom tier of no. our society no, in I, income. I was making a very good, a very good <laughs> livable wage. Mm -hmm. But what amazed me, and what we could say here, is that what we're looking in terms of revenue, or if we want to call it a tax, tax is a very sensitive word, but mm -hmm. let's say called revenue. Mm -hmm. It's money that's there. It's already being spent. Right. This is already being spent. In the private sector, private employers, it's called your benefits or your health insurance premium. So if we flip that and say, well, it's no longer called a premium, it's called a Medicare for all revenue source, mm -hmm. we could then, for better words, soften the potential impact of this if someone looks at us, oh, you're gonna raise my taxes. No, no we're, gonna, really. we're gonna regard what's already being spent in a healthcare system mm -hmm. that's not generating the desired results we want. As we say, not everybody's covered and the efficiency of the delivery, some people are still sick, some people are not getting the right care, uh, and so forth. So I think we could look at this in that way that says, hey, let's, let's, and employers should, should, I would think, should cheer. If they don't have to spend this, then they're more equal for those employers that still do not provide health insurance coverage for their employees. It takes that whole health insurance benefit thing, do we have it at this company or not? Do we have it at that company or not? Take it out of that, make employment what it is, a revenue generator for the owner, or the shareholders of that company, and then health insurance is, is a part and outside that that financial mechanism. It, it, it makes a lot of sense to at least look at it very seriously that way, as we are in this program. As we are. And now let's look at some of the benefits for employers 
and employees or households mm -hmm. under this system. It turns out that uh, even with what we're advocating on this program, that the employer is going to save money and so will the employee. Mm -hmm. uh, Don, you might want to comment on those. Well, yeah, uh, certainly um, health insurance as a cost to an employer uh, in, in many respects over the years has been an age-denominated issue. That is to say, uh, an employer has a choice between hiring somebody that's two years experience, two to three years experience, got the college degree, or someone which, like me, may have 30 years, <laughs> knows the ropes, has plenty of stories to share, could, could cut to the chase and get it done in half the time. But when you look at the dollars and cents of, of employee costs, you have to recognize that someone in their 20s, we'll put that age band in there, the 20s, versus someone in their, their mature years, 50s up to Medicare age, which currently is 65, you're going to see that it is three to five times as much to pay the health insurance for that older worker than it is for the younger worker. So scratch that off. <laughs> we don't want, and I'm speaking strictly from a monetary, you know, mm -hmm. hey, what looks better on this one mm -hmm. versus that? Hey, this 20-something is going to be more desirable strictly from a cost of employment. Mm -hmm. Not only to mention, you know, someone in, that has that experience is going to probably make more. They're going to have more vacation time eligible. Mm -hmm. Uh, they may take more sick time because people that are older do get sicker than younger people. But the bottom line is when there's a choice between younger and older, then you have the, the, the bias toward the, the young because the health insurance cost is factored into that cost of employment. If you take that out, then everybody becomes more equalized. You know, Then you say, well, what, what, what difference are we looking for? Do we want someone that can hit the bricks running? We don't need to train someone because training costs which yeah. are not in this, That's right. would have to be factored into that, to that new employment situation. And we get more equity as a result. Uh, it's, it's much more equitable, and um, I think Don's really framed it uh, really appropriately. And, and um, you know, the reason why these, this, this slide shows savings to families and, and to employers is because, because of what's on the previous slide. What you've done is you've broadened the base of financing for health care in the United States, mm -hmm. and you're taxing some obvious sources of wealth and revenue that currently remain sort of beyond touch. Um, the, you know, there's tr we're generating tremendous wealth in this country, and some of that needs to be reinvested and redistributed back into providing services for the people and care for the people who are helping to produce that wealth. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so another part of this is we've raised the upper tax rates. Our current proposal on MFA is to address the upper income levels with higher marginal tax rates than are paid now. So we're talking about 50% on income from 250,000 to 500,000. But by contrast, back in 1960, the rate for that group was 89%. And in 1980, it was 70%. So this is still not hitting those higher levels that were back then. Then we're saying 55% from half a million to $2 million. In 1960, it was 90%. 1980, it was straight through at 70%. 65% uh, on income from 2 million to 10 million. 1960 was 91%, which was the cap that they had in those days. But imagine, uh, if you're in that level, back in those days, you were paying uh, nine out of ten dollars of income uh, in taxes and that and that went on and we're going to see that that was not an, an unusual situation it was actually quite common mm -hmm. and um, in 1980 it was capped out at 70 percent but it went on for many years at that level and we're capping at 70 percent on income above 10 million now i was in college in uh, some of these years like in the 70s look at that 70 percent a mar upper margin rate uh, all through those years and what that did by the way when I was in college uh, UCLA tuition where he is now a professor was hundred and twenty dollars a year yep. I went to the University of Southern California my tuition was nine hundred seventy dollars a year mm -hmm. today it's sixty six thousand dollars a year um, UCLA is about 15 or so, is that what it is? A little higher. A little higher, 16, something like that. Um, because government had a lot of money that was coming in to fund 
public education, especially higher education, and uh, therefore private schools like USC, uh, was down there too. $970 a year when I went to school was equivalent to the cost of a summer vacation. That, that was it. Hmm. And I went to an LA City College course uh, to make up a physics uh, course that I needed in the summer and it cost me $3.50. Today we have a much different perspective going on because the government is not collecting the revenue levels they were in those days. This is why I feel that my generation had it pretty good. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we're hoping to be able to recover that for newer generations that can live better than they are now. But when you look at those tax rates, uh, they're in the 30s and they, they began to dive in uh, 1982 after the Reagan administration came in. And the Reagan administration cut those taxes severely, as you can see, of, or 20 basis points. Mm -hmm and uh, but triple the national debt in five years by doing that. We have the same thing happen uh, in our current year where there's been tax reform, uh, huge drastic uh, tax uh, decreases. And so this year, the federal government is projecting nearly a trillion dollar deficit because of cutting those taxes and not having revenue sources to replace them. So that's, that's what happens. Yeah, and added, adding to that thought, when you look at the premium for health insurance that your employer is paying. Let's just say it's between 15 and 20 percent, roughly, or even 10 to 20 percent. If you flip that, as I mentioned earlier, and source it as a, as a government or government revenue uh, derivative, then you're bringing that 30 percent top marginal rate up to 47 percent. Let's make it another 5 percent. That would be 52 percent. Now we're talking about money that's no different. Mm -hmm. Employees still making the same amount of income. Mm -hmm. We don't want to cut anyone's uh, income. But by the same token, we want to improve the medical care and we want an efficiency in system that will not raise taxes overall in terms of the payroll for the individual employee who's just going to see fewer and fewer dollars in his or her pocket. But what we have, Zane, and I think uh, we have what you mentioned earlier, the 52% uh, the tax rate of Denmark. So if we add that 15 to that percent to mm -hmm. the 37 mm -hmm. for the top marginal here, we now are at the Denmark cost. Mm -hmm. And there's no argument. This but everybody's board, covered and everybody has covered. free college everybody's also. Everybody's covered. The employer's That's relieved right. of, the, of yeah. the, the, the financial burden. Employers are more competitive because they know, hey, I just lost a good applicant because he's going over there where they have health insurance. We don't offer it or it's cheaper over there. There's none of that. The, the, the inequity is literally removed from the whole model and it becomes outside the employment, employer-employee system, which is where the strain of it really comes from. I mean, it really does. And right? as we've discovered, I haven't presented the data, but um, we can look at data. We've looked at data before on this program. Um, those com countries are happier. They're among yeah. the happiest well, in the world. Look at, look at how happy Medicare recipients are. Everybody that I've asked, hey, how do you like Medicare insurance? I have not talked to someone who did not like their Medicare insurance. One of, the most, one of the most puzzling questions uh, for me over the years is if Medicare is so popular among seniors, why is Medicare for all such a bad idea? If it's such a great program and yep. seniors are so satisfied and there are surveys and data to show that, the, that seniors are happier with Medicare than they were generally with their private insurance and yet it seems to be a it's such a bad idea to extend it to the rest of the population. Yep. It just doesn't make sense. Well, that's outside the area of economics, I believe. I, I believe that I, it has to do with ideologies. I agree. Oh, right. um, and our show, again, is not a political show. Ours is yeah. an economic show. We're just showing an economic approach. Well, I think in terms of flipping back to, I have a younger daughter. And when it's time for open enrollment, there's this question, well, what kind of insurance should I get? Because typically there's all kinds of different programs and uh, costs that, go, of course, go into that. But again, becoming a, a, a basket for everyone, we don't have to worry about those choices. They're already there for us. All we have to do is make is actualize on our health, make the correct decisions, get to the doctor. Don't wait till you see if it goes away because you, you may just be getting sicker. You know, and then the cost of the actual care could be more because you've got an advanced issue yeah, going on. That's right. Yeah. So life can be better, and we're trying to present a way to make it better on this program today. On the cost, yes. Uh, the next uh, detailed one here, 5% uh, Medicare for all value-added tax raises $2.45 $2 trillion over 10 years. 
Uh, there's the detail on how it does that. Uh, offshore profit tax raises 8.79 trillion over 10 years and brings more businesses back home, we hope. <laughs> uh, the 0.4% equity security sales tax. Now this raises 8.71 trillion over 10 years, but Sweden tried something like this from 1983 to 1991. And we have a little note about that down below on this slide. They started with a 1% tax on securities transactions. They then went to 2%. Now that's as pointed out here in the bottom, uh, it's five times what we're proposing here. But when Sweden did that at that level, capital flew away. They went to the London Stock Exchange to trade securities. Mm -hmm. uh, the values of Sweden's stock, uh, stocks on the average went down like 2.2% here and another 0.8%. So there is an impact when you do introduce a securities tax um, by some information that I'm not gonna present in detail right now, it appears that when that first would hit, you would see maybe a 500 point drop in the Dow Jones Industrial Averages. You probably would see that. Um, but in terms of abandoning it, uh, like Sweden did, because they had five times what we were doing, we do not anticipate that to happen, but we did want to present this is a, uh, an ambitious new method that no country has tried at this level. So we don't really know, but this is what we propose on the program. Okay. Now, does this eliminate any fractional uh, derivative or, or uh, take away from any capital gains tax that's currently in the system? Uh, no, capital gains is part of income taxes. This is a sales tax is okay. what this is. So we that's that all this is, yeah. Okay. Um, it doesn't impact any of that that we do have income taxes addressed earlier. So uh, we find with this approach that it appears that we can raise this money, 84% of what we would pay right now by not changing anything and actually uh, having everybody covered and having a higher level of care with no cost sharing. No country is proposing what we're proposing as far as I know on this program. Is that true, Jerry? I, I said it earlier, there is no country that provides complete federal financing or, or government financing of health care without any cost sharing. Um, every other country has some, some minimal cost sharing and um, some small role for private insurance uh, that is uh, somewhat larger than is laid out here. Okay, now, what about taking care of the poor people in the insurance companies? <laughs> uh, we did research on that. We found out that insurance professionals, uh, both in uh, the uh, financing aspect and in the delivery aspect, they make a fairly good income. They make, uh, with uh, bonuses and everything, I think it's around 87000 a year on the average without the bonuses and 92.5 with the bonuses. What about these people that we're going to put out of work? <laughs> so we have provided for that. And in fact, uh, our proposal covers them, which we feel is a very generous approach. It's a four-year transition. Uh, the whole plan is a five-year transition, but taking care of people in the insurance industry, which would mostly disappear except for uh, very high levels of care, very exotic forms of care that we might want that uh, wealthy people might want uh, first year uh, we would subsidize them or aid them in retraining as whatever the program may require for most efficiency uh, 44.4 billion dollars they get the first year so they get on the average of 55,500 out of their 92 in the first year even if they're still working they still are going to get a up to a half of uh, or more than a half of their income subsidy year two 35 billion. That's still more than a third of the 92. Uh, year three, 25 billion. And finally, year four, 15.6 billion, which totals $120 billion of assistance to people in the insurance industry or people who work with delivering the private insurance. $120 billion equals the United States Afghan war cost for only two and a half years. So just for that alone, if we happen to pull out of Afghanistan, who knows 
that's a political decision. But that, that alone, for just half, almost a little more than half of this period, will actually pay for all these people. <laughs> So uh, we're very comfortable about how to fund that, in, not only with our own budget uh, in this. I just put the Afghan thing in there as a kind of a footnote in a way to all this. So as a result of that, uh, what did Winston Churchill say? Healthy, Healthy citizens, citizens are the greatest course. asset any country can have. Healthy citizens are the greatest asset any country can have. Why is that? Well, I think it gets back to what you mentioned earlier about uh, the national state of happiness. If we're if we're healthy, we're happy. I don't know of anybody that's unhealthy and and happy. I mean, they're, they're always talking about hey, their medical aches and pains, or gee, they wish they could walk, or they're confined to a chair or a bed. Um, so the healthier citizen is a, is a, is an asset. It's a, it's a productive person. Maybe they'll get out to vote. Maybe they'll vote, and uh, they'll they'll I fight. would think you have a lot less crime. I mean, I would like to see anybody's daughter or son go out at midnight and not worry about any being accosted. This will contribute to that. When you have healthy people, you have more prosperous people, uh, you have a more peaceful society and a happier society and a safer society. And the one component we can add to that to that value context, and I, you mentioned it very briefly at the beginning of today's program, is mental health care. That yes. is probably the most serious area that dovetails into uh, the gun violence issue we've been seeing, the crime you just mentioned. Um, crime is often strong arm with, with a weaponry or a knife or something, but if we can get the mental health improvement, I think we could see a great improvement in society overall. Absolutely. Very good and if, if this will deliver that result, that's great. I mean, we're taking a shot for we're it. We're taking a shot. Well, and I think that one of the issues that, again, as a public health professional, um, I certainly believe and I've spent my career working towards universal coverage in the United States because I believe the, the basic premise of the statement, which is that this is an investment. Uh, in our most valuable resource. And I will acknowledge that there is debate within the health economics community about whether healthcare is an investment or whether it's pure consumption. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that the debate will range on uh, and there are economists who will fall on either side of that debate. I happen to believe that it's an investment and um, I think that the it's appropriate that you've quoted Churchill having just read biography, uh, the third volume of his biography by William Manchester that deals with the war years. The section that talks about the origins of the National Health Service, it was in 1942 in the depths of the war when it looked very bleak. It was not clear which way the war was going to go, but um, Churchill acknowledged, even though he was a conservative, he acknowledged that maybe we need to start thinking about the world after this war and what life will be like for the people of England and we need to offer them hope and this is part of that. Now this began, universal health care began with Otto von Bismarck, right? Yes. And where and when? Uh, well in the uh, 1880s in Germany. Mm -hmm. So well, Way and, back and, then. And even England had uh, 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 mandatory health insurance uh, starting in 1911 as, as well. So mm -hmm. the origins of social insurance are uh, deep in the history of Europe. Um, and um, the, the discussions in the United States, which also during the progressive era uh, were emerging during that time, were effectively um, uh, went in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And the United States didn't even have health insurance until 1929? That is correct. Um, they, we, we had workers' compensation uh, which, with the first health insurance plans mm -hmm. in the United States in 1911. Oh. Uh, and uh, uh, the labor uh, leaders who were advocating for workers' compensation, uh, which were adopted at the state level, that was not a federal law that, that led to workers' comp. Wisconsin was the first state. California was one of the, the that followed quickly. Um, but labor leaders turned their attention as the idea for workers' comp caught on, said, now we need to broaden the concept of health insurance to include not just industrial workers, but to include people who don't work in factories and, and the family members 
of workers who are not covered by workers' compensation. Uh, and uh, those ideas gained some traction uh, in the 1910s, but by the 1920s had gone in a different direction. And so look at the heritage involved here. We're not inventing anything particularly new, but we have figured out how to pay for it, how it's going to cost less, how people are going to be healthier, happier, we hope. So we hope that our viewers have enjoyed this presentation and we'll also look at the data that we have presented, uh, consider a number of things. Any other comments, gentlemen, on this? I think uh, the comment about workers' compensation is, is so true. It is an equal system. There's no difference in premium or, or benefits for the injured worker, it's, and it's no different from one employer to the next. It's managed by the state, it's taken care of, and it, uh, it's, the, it's the best system we can have for equality in that respect of medical delivery that I know of currently. And that means a lot coming from you, Don, who's had so much experience with insurance. So I want to thank you both for appearing on the thank program. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zane. I think we've covered an awful lot of ground and uh, we invite our audience to check this out, maybe repeatedly, and look for us again on the next Economic Solutions program. Thank you. Mm -hmm.